folks. Um, we had a little difficulty getting the, the, the computer glitches going here this morning, but we're, I think, operating good now. I, um, I always look at confined spaces as being one of the most hazardous areas that people work in. And that's why it takes three sessions to cover it. And today we'll we'll really do sort of an introduction uh, on what what makes a confined space and some of the common hazards of confined space work. Uh, the next class will be on um, permit required. What what makes a permit necessary? How do you do a permit? What does OSHA require? <clears throat> and then the third session we'll we'll talk about uh, rescue and retrieval from a confined space. So. It'll, it'll take a while, and um, feel free to raise your hand if you have a question. And um, I don't know if I'll see it or not. I'm, I don't see that on my screen, uh, the line. I'll let you know, Frank, if anyone has a question. OK. OK. Good enough. Then on the agenda, it says, what makes a confined space? You know, that's sort of like uh, if I ask my wife, what does she have to do to clean the house? Um, if I got three days, I can get an answer. And this is that confined spaces can be almost anything if it if it lacks a lot of access and egress or adequate access and egress, and if it lacks good ventilation. Now, having some ventilation doesn't negate it being a confined space. But the two main things is ventilation and being able to get in and out of it. That's what makes a confined space. Now, that means that if you're thinking of a small manhole, a small bulwark in a, in a ship or a bulkhead, if you're thinking of a small basement room, uh, that could be a confined space. However, if you went out to uh, one of the big astrodomes that they play football, and you blocked off every entrance but one, and you cut off all the ventilation, um, technically that could be a confined space. Because you can't get in and out easy, and you can't, and you will eventually run out of air, run out of good air. So a confined space is not necessarily something small. I doubt it would be the Astrodome, but I, I use that as a, an example. Um, I've had people uh, get ill and and uh, and suffer some grave consequences in rooms that were, you know, had a, had a thousand square feet in them, but they didn't have adequate ventilation. Um, for instance, too, you could put a, a a class a classroom with a number of people in it, and if it only had one door and the ventilation went out, you you you're working in a confined space. So, being a little bit facetious. It can be identified by many things. Now, the common hazards uh, of confined space, confined spaces, and welding. That could be welding or just working. I use welding as the example because that's one of the most hazardous things to do in a confined space. And then you have welding or working in confined spaces. You need to put up with combustibility, the hazard of heat stress the hazard of toxicity, and the hazard of um, oxygen deficiency, which is one of them that is often not recognized. Um, too many people just uh, run out of oxygen and keel over and didn't know they did. So let's go to the next slide. And I already mentioned this, what makes a confined space, little or no ventilation, limited access and egress. And here it says, not meant for human habitation, which which does bring you away from the Astrodome. However, uh, the common examples, of things you run into, would be tunnels, manholes, sewers, subcellars. Um, you've got things like pipelines, tank trucks. Uh, we recently had a death in this area <clears throat> in southern Virginia, a man working inside a tanker truck. He had to climb in and do work, and, and he died in there. And um, so uh, anything that is, is, uh, is hard to get in and out of, that's probably the biggest thing, with the second thing being uh, little or no ventilation. 
So anyway, let's go to the next slide here and the common hazards. Uh, working in any task is difficult. Let's, let's give an example. If you were going down to work in a confined space, you have to be able to get in and out. Getting in and out is a problem. So if something goes wrong and the hazard takes place between you and the one exit, you got to get through that hazard. Or if there's, say, an explosion, um, you got no way to hide from it. You got no place to get away from it. You're gonna you're gonna receive the whole impact of that explosion. Um, combustib uh, um, combustibility, uh, flammability, fumes, all of these things. The basic thing is you can't get away from it. You're in the middle of it. You can't stick your head out the door. It's it's right there. You are in the middle of it, and you can't get away. And then <clears throat> utilize every safeguard available. Now, we're going to talk more about this as we go on, but uh, you need to have a watcher. If, if you're going down into a confined space or you're going to send an employee into a confined space, you need to have someone stationed outside. Now, stationed outside does not mean that they're running a bulldozer nearby. It doesn't mean that they're... Uh, running a machine nearby. It means they're right outside the entrance and they're watching and listening and being aware of what the person inside the confined space is doing. And then uh, I, I, at the bottom I've got high heat can cause heat stress. This is a hazard that a lot of people don't recognize. Uh, they just don't even think about it. They worry so much about explosions or lack of oxygen they don't think about heat stress. And we'll, we'll talk more about that as we go on. <clears throat> but you think of a, kind, a confined space with no ventilation and not suitable to live in. End of story. And uh, it only it takes our best efforts. We have to use every caution that we have available, every resource we have available to protect the persons working in a confined space. Um, you, you just you cannot take it lightly. Um, the, the, the accident that happened in this area recently, uh, the man came into work. He went down into the confined space by himself. There was nobody outside stationed to watch him. He didn't even tell anybody he was going in there. He was a young guy, 22 years old, and the, the only error the employer made was they didn't tell him not to do this kind of stuff, didn't train him, didn't did not let him know the hazards of doing it. He was trying to get a job done uh, and get it done quickly. And he wound up dying because of it. So confined spaces add a huge element of danger to every task that you do. <clears throat> and think of if you're in a small space. I mean, even if it's not a confined space. You're in a small space. You're in a house that's burning. And the fire is between you and the door to get out. Think of think of that. That's what a fire in a confined space would be. You have to get through the hazard to get safe. Uh, and, and an explosion. I was in, in investigating an accident where a man had um, had been in an explosion in a confined space. The interesting thing was. There was very little heat generated, very little fire. Uh, it was just an explosion, took a millisecond. The man died, and almost every bone in his body was shattered. His skin had no bruises, nothing hit him. He wasn't beat up. Um, it just happened that the concussion broke all his bones. And, um, you know, it, he had no place to go had no place to hide, and he was in that small space. And then the to sometimes you can smell toxic air, uh, nasty air, bad air, poisonous air. But sometimes you can't smell it. And we'll, we'll go into these later, but uh, carbon monoxide is probably the most deadly 
toxic air you can have, and yet there's no smell, no taste, it's invisible, and you don't feel it. So you need to be aware that this is one of the habits also of working in confined spaces. And then <clears throat> confined spaces have many other dangers. In a welding situation, you're creating a lot of fumes. Some of the fumes may not be deadly, but they may be uh, toxic enough to make you ill or sick or cause you know a, a respiratory irritation. Um, welders also, and anybody working with uh, any kind of s systems that require inert gas, i.e. nitrogen, argon, helium, like a welder goes down into a confined space and he's welding with nitrogen as an inert gas. What's happening? He's welding. Nitrogen doesn't kill you. It's harmless. However, it comes into the confined space. It displaces oxygen, and the guy keels over from lack of oxygen because you can't breathe nitrogen. At least you, you can breathe it, but you've got to have oxygen with it. Uh, <clears throat> the air we breathe outside, for instance, um, in the regular atmosphere is 78%, give or take a, a point or two, nitrogen. And we don't die, but the other 21% is oxygen, which keeps us alive. If you eliminate that 21% and make it 98% nitrogen, you're going to die. And, and you'll die from asphyx asphyxiation. And then uh, <clears throat> you've got, as I mentioned, the heat stress. Um, heat stress can affect everything in your system. Um, and yet heat stress is, is often not recognized. And as I mentioned already, the oxygen deficiency, and we mentioned the toxicity. Toxicity can be uh, fatal. But toxicity can also be uh, just an irritant. It can make you sick, can cause emphysema, uh, can cause lung cancer at a later date. <clears throat> this is one thing that I, I, I'll mention at this point, and I, I do a lot of safety talks. And one of the things I always mention is that, you know, doing the job right is the best way. You know, just make sure you do it right. Um, because we think of safety as preventing accidents. You cut your finger, you break your arm, you cut your foot, you get a concussion, and we have hard hats and gloves and safety shoes and all that to protect against those things. The other area that we often forget is illness. Now, let me tell you this, this illustration. You've all got relatives uh, who you've heard them say, I'm going to retire. Maybe your grandparents, maybe your parents. And they can't wait till they reach 65 and they want to retire and they want to travel the country with their honey they want to visit the grandchildren. They want to fish, hunt, play golf, go down to that place in Florida and play golf and have a good time. Uh, and they work for 40, 45, or 50 years, finally retire, retire for six months, and die. They're dead. They're gone. And then there's a spouse left behind who's sad and, and, and all by himself. Now, that didn't happen overnight. A lot of those things, they may have not been wearing respiratory protection for 40 years. Did it, did it show up? No. Did it happen? No. All of a sudden, it reaches a point where it's too much and it kills you. So you need to be careful that you do the right things over that 40-year period so you can have that long retirement, so you can have that uh, trips and, and and uh, enjoy your, your grandchildren. Because illness is as vital to prevent as is a broken arm. And that's a lot of times that has to do with respiratory. Uh, <clears throat> it can be uh, ultraviolet rays from doing various, uh, like arc welding, that can cause skin cancer at a later date. Um, you know, our cataracts are a problem that take years to develop. Now, oh, it seems like almost everybody gets cataracts eventually, but they can be 
uh, it can be mitigated by or not mitigated, but uh, irritated and cause them more by uh, sharp uh, radiation, ultraviolet arc welding, uh, even bright sun. So you need to make sure that these things, and, and, in, in, and I, I'm a little off confined spaces, but that's my safety message, okay. And uh, then you've got confined spaces and conditions give you limited space. It causes you to organize your work. You can't spread it out. Uh, and then you got ventilation problems or the presence of flammable gases. <clears throat> and then combustibility can take place from many, many things. If you've got a gas down there that's flammable, and it can be it can be oxygen and something else. But the oxygen, for instance, acetylene and oxygen together make a very hot flame. You could have uh, oxygen, and you could be breathing, but there might be another gas down there. And, and then all of a sudden, sparks from a grinder get in that gas. The gas ignites, but the ignition is enhanced by the presence of oxygen. Uh, it can ignite from static electricity. Uh, you never smoke in confined spaces. Never. Uh, you always use grounded uh, electrical equipment and have GFCIs on everything. That's a ground fault circuit interrupter. But, <clears throat> but we have recorded in the past that even static electricity or a spark from nails in a shoe have caused ignition down in a confined space where the gas was flammable. All right, then we get on. This is we talked about the heat stress. You know, I, I grew up in in, uh, in farm country. And uh, we used to milk cows. And I had a farmer, and he expressed heat stress as a uh, heat stroke as being like the old farm dog that sneaks up behind you and bites you on the backside. You know, you didn't know it was going to happen. You weren't expecting it, and all of a sudden he was there. It was unexpected and never planned for. Heat stress is much like that. <clears throat> and then prepare. Heat stress, I mean, uh, confined spaces will cause you or will make you, it actually, you, you've got to prepare. You cannot go into a confined space without being ready. That means you dress right, you have the right PPE, you have the right people outside, you got the right ventilation. You do everything before you go into the confined space. And then, um, uh, if you're wearing protective gear, let's say you, you have to wear some form of heavy body gear or protective suit, then that makes the heat factor, the heat stress problem, even more. So if you're wearing a lot of protective gear, you got to be more aware of, of heat stress. And then <clears throat> with heat stress, never rely on thirst or sweat. One of the signs of heat stress is you stop sweating. You're not thirsty, and um, but that doesn't mean you're not overheated. Uh, what happens is your body, you become dehydrated, and your body recognizes that you need liquids. So your body shuts down the sweating system so that you'll conserve what moisture is in your body. The problem is the moisture then in your body is contaminated um, and you wind up, you wind up could be sick from many, many things. Uh, let's do, let's give you this example. If you have high blood pressure, uh, I remember one time I was at at the Navy base in Norfolk working in confined spaces, and I just was so hot I drank Gatorade. I'm not picking on Gatorade, okay. Uh, Gatorade is a, a good product, but I, they had they had it there, and I drank it, and I drank it, and I drank it, and I was there for two weeks. When I got home, my wife noticed my legs were just swelled up, and my feet were all swelled up, and what had happened was I have high blood pressure, and it caused my feet to swell because Gatorade, even though it provides electrolytes, also has high sodium, and for people with high blood pressure, that's not good. So 
you know, I was able then to find another product uh, that didn't cause that of people with high blood pressure. And that product is Squincher, made by Gatorade, but it's a low sodium product. So the point I'm trying to make is be careful what you do. Don't overdo anything. If you in a hot area, the very best thing you can do is drink water. Drink water every 20 or 30 minutes. Drink six or eight ounces of water, period. You'll be surprised how much that'll do. If you need to or want to drink the, the electrolyte producing products like Gatorade, do that. But be careful. I don't, don't overdo it. And then one other thing you don't want to do is don't drink coffee. Coffee's not good. It's too much caffeine in it for heat stress. And stay away from the uh, tea and stay away from any kind of alcoholic beverages. You know, it's great to think, oh, I have a cold course. No, that doesn't work. That's not going to be a good thing for you to do. So stay away from those products when in a confined space. And you'll be a lot, lot better off. Now, you need to know the symptoms and indications that you're overheated. Number one, if you're not sweating, that's, <laughs> we already mentioned that one. So if you stop sweating, you got a problem. But if you're starting to get dizzy or you're starting to get nausea from, you know, when you work outdoors, all of a sudden you're getting nauseous, don't keep working. Even if you're home doing this, you're working in the garden and you get nauseous, go take a rest, go relax, get out of the hot sun. Uh, you start getting severe headaches or you're breathing or respiratory problems or any answer. Just, you know, make sure that you watch for these symptoms and take care of it as, as much as you can. And then the best thing to do is make sure you prevent. All right? I mentioned these, but drink plenty of fluids. And uh, if, you, if you can't get the electrolyte-type fluids, then drink plain water. They got some new drinks out today that are, uh, provide electrolytes with very little sodium. They're almost like clear water. Um, uh, but another thing that you don't want to do, though, and I just, I'm just backing up here a little bit, people today are hung up on these new energy drinks. Um, you know, take take five ounces at two o'clock, and the energy is renewed. It shows secretaries and it shows workers and construction people all you know, drinking this high energy drinks. If you're working in a confined space, stay clear of that stuff. All right? <clears throat> stay, stay clear totally because it's going to do nothing but make you worse off. And then um, dehydration can bring on severe illness and even permanent injury. The other area you don't have to think of is if you're working outdoors, you're working on some kind of scaffolding, you're working on a roof, you're working on a machine and you get dizzy, you can fall over. You can you you become clumsy, you can trip easier and uh you could you could wind up being hurt by a machine. Uh let's say you're you're outside pushing a lawnmower and you get dehydrated and you get dizzy, you fall down and the lawnmower runs over you. I'm being a little facetious, but those kind of things do and can happen. And then toxic fumes. This is one of my one of my high points because they're everywhere. All right? Toxic fumes are everywhere, but they're diluted by so much clean air they become harmless. But in confined spaces, they become concentrated and they can become lethal. It takes many forms. You have toxic metal fumes, toxic chemical fumes, and you have toxic metallic fumes. Now, lead is a toxic metal fume. We've heard the stories of lead and, you know, little children who uh, um, chew on old windowsills that have been painted with lead paint wind up with brain damage. Uh, lead is in many steels. Uh, steel will have a small amount of lead in it to make it easier to machine. It's called free, free machining steel. Uh, now, if you're welding on that or you're cutting on it or you're heating it up, the lead will vaporize and guess where it goes? To you and you breathe it in. Um, so lead is a very harmful substance. Um, I, I had a class one time and there was a man in there. I thought he was handicapped. 
I mean, he was, but I, I it was noticeable. And he came up afterwards, and in broken speech and not being able to hold his hand still, he explained that he had his own um, bullet, and uh, uh, he used to make his own bullets and ammunition, and he would go buy old scrap lead and melt it down in his garage, and he was permanently handicapped from melting lead down. He didn't wear any equipment. He was just doing it. It came because he didn't know. Uh, so lead is very harmful and found in many, many things. And then cadmium. <clears throat> now, cadmium is less common today than it used to be as far as being an alloy in, like it used to be an alloy in silver solder, but it's not used anymore. But it is a corrosion barrier on steel. Cadmium-plated bolts, cadmium-plated steel will not rust, will not corrode. Problem is if you heat them up, weld on them, grind on them, you can, you in, you can ingest the cadmium into your system. By the way, cadmium and lead can both be absorbed right through your skin. If, if, if the fumes uh, and you're in the fumes, they can be absorbed right through your skin. But cadmium is one of those really, really deadly things because if you're a young man, say you're 25 years old, and you were to get some cadmium in your system, maybe from welding, maybe you were cutting on cadmium-plated bolts or whatever, you get it in your system when you're 25 years old. If you live to be 85 years old and they were to do an autopsy, that little bit of cadmium would still be in your system. That's what makes it so harmful. It never leaves. You may have some in your system not enough to kill you, not enough to hurt you. But then six months, eight months, eight years later, you get some more. Another few years, you get some more. Then all of a sudden, you reach a point where it's very harmful and it causes uh, it, it causes severe heart problems, blood problems, and you can you can actually die from it. And then beryllium is uh, produces toxic fumes. It's used in copper to make it uh, suitable for things like bus bars that are used in industry. And um, beryllium and cadmium are both deadly, but cadmium more so. And lead is is not so much deadly as it is causing brain damage, which is all, which is worse, uh, being killed or living on with without common sense or living on without your brain functioning correctly. I'm not sure. Um, not a pleasant topic, is it? I'm sorry to be so, so um, um, I don't know, so down on this, but, but there's some serious consequences to confined spaces. Then you've got chemical fumes, ozone. <clears throat> ozone is an air pollutant either created by lightning um, or storms as it passes through atmospheric oxygen. Um, it displaces oxygen. Now, we, we, we have all this stuff about our ozone layers being depleted. Um, you know, every time electricity passes through oxygen, it creates ozone. That means if, you're, if you have an electric current <laughs> running in your house, you're creating ozone. Okay, if you have electric current welding, you're creating ozone. Every time there's a lightning strike, it creates ozone. I'm not really sure that that's a, uh, I'm not sure where that danger comes. I don't really think it's as much of an issue as they want to make out. However, ozone in excess quantities will displace oxygen. And when, it, when there's no oxygen, you keel over and, and you, you can't live. Then phosgene <clears throat> is created when you heat up or well through many degreases and cleaners. Uh, Typically, it's not a big issue because, uh, fortunately, we've eliminated most of the um, most of the harmful degreasers and cleaners from industry. Uh, sulfur dioxide, hydrogen sulfide are both byproducts, both toxic. Neither one of them is deadly, but they can make you really sick. And then you get metallic flutes. Uh Zinc. You know what zinc is? It's galvanized steel. Um, it, it's put on as a coating to protect metals from rusting. Um, if you were to 
grind on it and got the dust in you, or if you were to weld on it and got the fumes in your system, uh, they don't make you, I mean, they, they won't kill you. But if you've ever had what they call galvanized poisoning or zinc poisoning, you aren't going to die, but you almost wish you would. You know, have you ever been that sick? Uh, you'll be throwing up and you'll have diarrhea and you'll have hot sweats and then you'll be freezing cold and you'll have a fever. I mean, every bit of your body is affected for 24 hours and then it goes away. Um, and the only bad part is that you become less and less resistant to getting sick. The, if a man keeps doing that with zinc, he'll get sick easier and easier and quicker and quicker. <clears throat> then we have copper. Copper fumes can make us sick in the same way as zinc. Uh, the Navy had years ago uh, many cases of what they call bronze poisoning. And that was from people working on parts of ammunition and parts of, of uh, guns and, and um, they, would, they would get sick. But again, they didn't die, they just were really, really sick. So you get those types of fumes. And then you get toxic fumes. Uh, and the biggest one and the most harmless, most harmful one is carbon monoxide. And um, the reason I say it's the most harmful is because if you have uh, 2,000 parts per million in the atmosphere, it's lethal in one hour. In other words, 2,000 parts per million. Think about that now. That, excuse my, my English, but that ain't very much. Okay, 2,000 parts per million is not very much, and yet if it was in a building and you were in the building, you'd be dead in one hour. Now, it's lethal in one minute if you have 1% in the atmosphere. Okay, if you're in a room and there's 1% carbon monoxide in that room or in that building, you'll last one minute. And the thing that makes it so bad is it's invisible, it's tasteless, and it's odorless. Now, we cannot, you know, downplay the effects of carbon monoxide. The movies, you go to the movies, and you, you, some gonna, some guy's going to commit suicide, and they show his car in the garage with the door shut, and they show all this smoke, and people run in and grab the body. You know, you know the old scene. Well, guess what? That's not real life. Okay, the smoke. And the fumes that you see and that you smell isn't what killed him. Okay, it's the stuff you don't see and you don't smell and you don't taste that killed him. And um, you know, it, it could the car could burn oil and make a lot of smoke. That's not going to kill him. It's that invisible, tasteless, odorless product called carbon monoxide. And by the way, there is no. We have filters for everything. You can wear respiratory filters for. Everything except carbon monoxide. You cannot filter out carbon monoxide. <clears throat> and then um, remember this. Many toxins can't be smelled, not just carbon monoxide. Many things can't be smelled or tasted. Many toxins irritate. Many toxins can cause headaches, dizziness, drowsiness, nausea, toxin. Toxins can cause asphyxiation and even death. Now, asphyxiation usually winds up in death. Uh, just so you, in case you don't know this, or maybe you do, but asphyxiation is just removing oxygen. We think of asphyxi asphyxiation as, you know, someone murdering someone by holding their hand or a pillow over their face, and they asphyxiate them. Well, that's not asphyxiation. Asphyxiation is um, lack of oxygen from any cause. You, if you put too much nitrogen in the atmosphere, as I mentioned earlier, and you displace the oxygen, you die from asphyxiation. So it's just not having oxygen to breathe. And then, as I mentioned, there's no filter for carbon monoxide, none. It's impossible to filter it out. You've got to eliminate it or get out of there. 
<clears throat> and welding oxygen deficiency. We've started on this. That's what causes asphyxiation. Now, what what can use up oxygen? And this is where we're probably going to close. But uh, if you've got a confined space, let's say there's an area under your plant that nobody ever goes in, but there was some metal down there. That metal rust was rusting, and it rusted and rusted. What does metal, what is the rusting process? Oxidation. Oxidation uses up oxygen. So if that was a sealed up area and a bunch of stuff rusted, the oxygen levels could be diminished. There might not be enough oxygen to breathe. Grow, growing plants. If there was, let's say there was some, I don't know, mushrooms growing, you know, I don't know if they consider the plant. But things that use up oxygen can cause asphyxiation. A fire can use up oxygen. An explosion, rusting, corrosion, decomposing organic matter, rotting vegetation can use up oxygen and can bring about asphy asphyxiation. <clears throat> then if you use up ox if you work in a confined space, you can use up oxygen by using a flame. You can use up oxygen by making a TIG welding and you displace it. When there's no oxygen, guess what? You don't breathe. When you don't breathe, you die of asphyxiation. Due to this, some confined space work requires a permit. And then we'll, we'll do that in the next session. But atmospheric oxygen levels range 19.5% to 21%. Confined space is this important. If you have below 19.5%, you you can be in severe problems. At 16%, you'll begin to fast breathe, accelerate heartbeat, and nausea. At 12%, you're not conscious. Anything below that, really, you're, you're going to die. Now, it gives a range, though, of 21.5%. OSHA, OSHA actually says 22% is the maximum oxygen levels you can have in a work area. Now, the reason you won't die from asphyxiation if you got too much oxygen, but too much oxygen enhances combustibility and flammability. And so things will ignite faster and burn hotter. So you can't exceed 22%. That's why we got 21.5% on here. So <clears throat> anyway, the oxygen levels are important. And as I mentioned, excess oxygen um, you must dilute it and and get it down to 19 and a half to 21. And then the summary, keep in mind, any hazard is more dangerous in a confined space. And I thank you and I hope you've picked up some good clues and I'll turn this back over to Bilan. All right, thank you, Frank. Thank you, Frank. Um, okay. I'm gonna open up all the microphones um, and see if anyone has any questions. Um, Tom, Randy, anybody? Do you have any questions? I do. Okay. Go for it. I, I'm just curious, does both the lack of access and ventilation have to be present for it to be considered a confined space or no. or either one? Either one, right. Right. Okay. It can be lack of ventilation or lack of e either one can be a problem. Okay. And in fact the next session we'll go into more of that, but yeah, either one. I mean um, that's why I use that illustration of the <laughs> of the, the astrodome. You know, that's yeah. I realize yeah. that's exaggerating, but but that could be either one. Okay? All right. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions? I, I yeah, this is Tom with Best Harvest Bakeries. Yeah. Hello. Yeah, I'm here. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, we have an oven that has two two places to get in and out of, and we do have combustion air, would that be considered a confined space entry? You have an ex you have two access and egress points? Yes, we have two egress points, plus while we're in there, we can we have uh, uh, forced air. And, uh, it's been a big talk around the bakery here whether that is considered a confined space or a, permit, a permitted space. Could you clarify that a little bit more? Yeah, I, I would call that, and and if you want to, if you want to send a picture in, 
to me, I'll, I'll go ahead and give you a written determination. But I would say that was a confined space, but probably not permit required. OK, OK, awesome. Okay. Thank and you. If you want to, uh, uh, Milan can give you the information. If you want to just send me a, uh, you know, a, a description, maybe a picture or two, I'll, I'll go ahead and give you the standards and write it up for you. Oh, that'd this be is, awesome. Thank this you. is Thomas Kent, right? Yes, ma'am. OK, I will uh, send you Frank's information when the SmartCast is over. That's outstanding. Thank you. Great. Anybody else? All right, that looks like it. That's okay. it. Um, yeah. If you have any additional questions, um, feel free and email them to um, uh, Future Office Network. Um, you can email them to info at Future Office Network, um, or info at your Future Office, excuse me. Um, and then we also, you can reach us um, on our, our line is 262-432-0707. And we do have part two of confined spaces coming up on May 30th, and then part three is on June 13th. So please attend those as well. And um, Frank, do you have any closing comments? No, I've I've enjoyed this. It's it's um, I, I mean I mean this in a facetious way. Nobody talked back. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. So. All right. Well, thank you for attending, everyone. Uh, remember to complete your surveys and have a great day. Thank you. Now.